everybody. Uh, I'm Denise Stevens and I'm chair of the DPLA board and would like to welcome all of our community and our guests to um, our open board meeting today, which has a focus on the future of digital access. And our colleague Felton Thomas will be facilitating a uh, panel discussion about that issue, which we think you will find very interesting. And we hope that you fully participate in that dialogue. But before we proceed with that, I'd like to uh, turn it over to John Bracken, our executive director, and uh, get an update from him. Thank you, Denise. And before we get started in this uh, Brady Bunch array of faces, I want to acknowledge um, the rest of the DPLA board that is here, some of whom are on camera, some of whom are not. So um, I won't call you all out to speak, but I'm just looking through. We'll be hearing from Felton. Joe Lucia is here from his from his den, um, and Kelvin Watson is here from Las Vegas. Elaine Westbrooks is here from the University of North Carolina. Good morning. Uh, Josh Fraser Sparks is with us from Bentonville, and I see Laura DeBone is here, and I know Catherine Marr is on her way in. Uh, Jill Bourne can't be here because she's traveling. And now as I say that, um, I lost count of which board, of the board member attendance list. Oh, and there's uh, Marsha Walker McWilliams from either from Hyde Park or from Northwest Indiana, depending on which, which office she's working from. Um, thank you all for being here at DPLA board. Thank you to our guests who will be handing the mic off to shortly. Um, and um, thank you to the DPLA staff. I wanna do, you know, like all of you, this transition into 2022 over the last 10 days has been intense. The DPLA staff have weathered a variety of health and personal and family and health issues uh, and also not dropped any balls on the, uh, it, during their day job. So, you know, I'm extra appreciative of the DPLA staff and who've just come through so strong during the last, whatever this is now, however, 22 months of this pandemic. We haven't been in a room together for almost two years. We had been hoping to do that this quarter and obviously that's not gonna happen, but I just wanna give a special shout out to the DPLA staff. This is a really exciting, <laughs> the last week notwithstanding and all the things we're focused on, this is, an 2022 is an exciting year for DPLA. Um, it's, it's an opportunity for us to engage our new board in new ways. I hope and believe it's gonna be an opportunity for us as a field to reflect on all that we've learned and the extra layer of urgency to our work from the last, the experience of the pandemic over the last two years. I think conversations like this one where that are focusing on digital access have an extra layer of urgency around equity and justice and historical, living up to historical wrongs and, and applying digital and digital technology and the possibilities of the internet strategically and intentionally to justice and restorative work in a way that didn't, we didn't have that level of urgency two years ago. And I think that's partly because of the tragedies that we've lived through as a society the last two years through the pandemic. Um, and I should say from a DPLA perspective, you know, in addition, we are beginning to think about our 10th anniversary in 2023 and all of what we've learned over the last two years, but certainly over the previous nine years are all due to be on the table. And, and, and most importantly, or maybe not most importantly, um, in-person conversations have been a key part of DPLA's formation um, and history. Uh, DPLA Fest hasn't happened now for almost three years. And we're beginning to think about the possibilities of getting together in person with our community and building off of conversations like this, which we know are really nice to have, but we're missing the in-person. And that's something we hear consistently from our community and, and on the staff. Um, so with that, I'm gonna stop and sort of just set the table before I hand it over to, to Greg Lucas from Sacramento. Um, the question on the table is, is is what does digital access mean? And as Michelle reminded me on Friday when we were chatting, you know, the a key grounding and something that I've been reflecting on a lot recently is this 
that notion that, notion that was key to the creation of the Digital Public Library of America, which is, wouldn't it be a tragedy if in the 21st century digital United States, Americans and library users and libraries had less access to content and knowledge and information than in an analog area. The possibilities of these tools like the ones we're using today are so great. And we know we're just scratching the surface as a society. And we also know that there are real challenges out there um, that run the risk of limiting our ability to access information and knowledge more so than we did in a pre-digital environment. And that would be a real tragedy. Um, but we're not gonna talk about tragedies today. We're gonna talk about possibilities and what the future may hold. And we're gonna start with Greg Lucas. And just as a fair uh, setup, Michelle Kimpton will be next in line and I'll hop in and I'll introduce you guys in succession. And then our colleague on the board, Felton Thomas, will, uh, when we're done with the four folks, guests, uh, we'll have a conversation that hopefully will involve all of you all and the DPLA board. So with that, welcome everyone, take your seats. And I wanna pass the mic to Greg Lucas, the State Librarian of California. Greg, thanks for being here. Oh, it's my pleasure. Um, I'm grateful that it's uh, such a small, narrow topic that we're each going to talk about for five minutes. Um, you know, what is digital access? So we think of it in California in, in several different ways. Not, uh, but I mean, most importantly, fundamentally, it comes back to the equity issues you were describing, John. But so broadly, right, for us, okay, how do we make, how do we connect California's 1130 libraries to high-speed um, broadband? And so we're at about a thousand. The, the remaining 130 are all the hard ones, of course. Um, but so that's kind of the, that's sort of the broad approach, right? How do we make sure that libraries can deliver these digital services to their communities? And then, and then more specifically, I think, uh, as you alluded to, right? So during the pandemic with physical library doors closed, um, people began entering libraries more, well, people had to enter library, do the digital front doors of their libraries. And here in California, that's accelerated sort of both the appreciation and the and the necessity, right, of improving the delivery of digital services that local, at least local libraries provide. And so, coming out of the pandemic now, the challenge that we've seen here is: all right, well, it's one thing if if your if your doors are closed and there's nobody inside the library, you can concentrate all of your resources on the delivery of digital services, right? So now with, with physical spaces opening again, you've got the same pie or in many instances, right? A shrunken, shrinking, what? I don't know, that sounds weird, but like the pie is smaller because there've been budget cuts or, or something like that. So it's the same amount of dough, but you're having to split what it goes for. So one thing we prioritized here at the state library is how can we um, provide services statewide to all the libraries that help them maintain this expectation, right? That's grown because of the pandemic, right? And the increased usage of digital resources. So today it's budget day in California. The governor right now, while we're talking is presenting his budget. And one of the things he included is, um, it's, I, don't hold me to this, but it's somewhere in the neighborhood of $9 million to continue two platforms that we created, use, we the State Library, created using ARPA funding um, to provide this, I, again, it's the wrong word, but this cafeteria, if you will, of uh, job skills, job training, uh, workforce development, uh, tools that, if, you know, preparation for tests, which is actually, that, which is very cool, um, that you can access either online at home or from the library. And so I think that's, that's an important role that at least we're trying to play because you can work a better deal, right, if through economies of scale, if it's one statewide contract. And it also uh, makes sure that opportunity is available to everyone. I mean, some of these things, it's like Coursera, LinkedIn Learning, Learning Express, 
I mean, some of these platforms, if, if you or I were to go out and subscribe to all of them, it'd be, you know, could be a grand, right, um, to, to have full access. So that, that's one way. And then another way is to begin connecting people on a personal level um, to the digital world. And we're seeing this, I mean, Alan can speak to this better than me, but I mean, we're seeing all over the country, this increase in looking at laptops and, and hotspots as something that libraries can check out. And um, I mean, that's a, it's a challenge in sort of keeping track of that, but that's one of the investments now we're taking uh, with our one-time money is to make more of those sorts of things available to local libraries who might not have the wherewithal to do a program like that on their own. And finally, um, I think there also has to be something like, uh, you know, help uh, for people who were checking out these dig digital the laptops and hotspots too. Um, one of the things we hear from at least smaller library jurisdictions is, yeah, we check this stuff out and then people call back and it's like, you know, we're spending a morning um, trying to provide technical assistance to somebody who we've checked out uh, a laptop or a hotspot to. And so we're trying to work on a solution to that as well here in California. That's got to be five minutes. Fabulous. Fabulous. Six and a half, but who's counting? Um, thank that's, you, Greg. It's less windy for me than normal. Stay, stay tuned. I see all Felton taking notes, so he's coming to you for questions. Uh, now it's my joy and pleasure to hand the mic to my colleague and friend, Michelle Kimpton, who at, at Lyricist runs the Palace Project, which is, I'm not even gonna say any more words about it because I think she's gonna give a much greater detail of this collaboration that we are lucky to be part of. Michelle, over to you. Great, thanks, John. Yeah, so at the Palace Project, we believe that libraries really play a critical role in the community by making knowledge accessible to all, regardless of age, geography, and income. And really an important part of serving knowledge is to be able to do so digitally. And that has really become heightened, as we all know, during the, the pandemic. And when you think about the future of digital access, I have to think about kids, kids and teens and young adults. They are the future. I have a couple myself and work with kids across uh, the DPLA company and the lyricist company. And these kids are completely digital now. They are consuming all of their information digitally from their school, from their textbooks, their reading materials. And this has really been not only streamlined, but really accelerated uh, during, the, during the pandemic. And, you know, I think if libraries are gonna continue to be a resource for our communities, including our future generations, they have to have a digital footprint that is interesting and accessible and evolving as our future generations want to use these platforms and have higher and higher expectations of what these platforms will do. So um, I, as John has mentioned, the senior director of the Palace Project, it is an open source platform and an app that today is built on the foundation for libraries to run and serve out their audio book content and their ebook content um, and aggregating all, all content providers that provide that content, including we have our own Palace uh, marketplace with that. But really going forward, I see it as a place where kids can use the platform to also take open access materials and recreate, recreate them, change them, modify them, publish them. It doesn't have to be limited to what is actually published by, um, publishers today. And, and this is a place where, you know, our future generations want to go. They want to be able to invent and create and the library can be a safe place to do that. And hopefully the Palace Project will be able to allow for that to happen and to also be next to curated materials from the library as well. So that's part of our vision uh, for the Palace Project. 
And, um, you know, lastly, I mean, just Overdrive produced, uh, gave us data points in the market uh, for last year, over a half a billion lens came from, you know, one vendor Overdrive. Um, so that has a significant growth in terms of ebook and audiobook lens throughout the country. So this is, you know, really here to stay. And so I know many times it was hard for libraries to kind of balance the demands of the physical space with the digital space. Um, but I, I believe really digital is here to stay. And if the half a billion lens is any demarcation of that, uh, I don't think that number is going down anytime soon. So it really has to become front and center, I believe, in what the libraries uh, begin to focus on. And libraries want their voice and their methodologies uh, in, in that process. So they don't want to be disintermediated from from their patrons in that process. So we hope to support um, all of that with the Palace Project, and that's all I'm going to say. Well, I hope you'll say more soon during the Q and A because I bet we're going to get questions. Um, before I pass the mic, thanks, Michelle. Pass the mic to Alan. I do want to acknowledge um, former board members in the audience. Uh, former DPLA board chair Amy Ryan. I see you in, entered the room, so I'm giving you a, a wave and former DPLA founding board member and really the founder of DPLA, Bob Darton, I see you in the gallery. So thank you both so much. We're gonna tee you up and give you extra chits to ask questions when we get to the Q&A. So I hope Felton might be calling on you soon. Um, it's my pleasure to hand the mic to Alan Inouye, who has just been a font of, you know, it's just such a key person and voice and, and um, observer of, of a lot of these topics that we're talking about from a policy seat is he does so as the senior director for public policy and government relations at ALA. And Alan, thank you for, for being here with us. Great, thank you. Uh, I like to uh, put uh, two different ideas on the table. One is a library centric idea and one is from the more expected from me, uh, legislative uh, oriented idea. Uh, for the library one, I'm thinking of so the future of digital access so to me, it's really future of access in libraries. Uh, and so, you know, we've, we've all talked a lot about the big increase in digital access during the pandemic uh, for all the obvious reasons. Uh, and the expectation that some of, some of it will stick afterwards. And the, the, the sum part is of course unknown and that the many new audience have, audiences have discovered the benefits of, of digital access. But the pandemic also underscored the value and importance of in-person engagement. Uh, that were curtailed in a library, in many libraries, or, or suspended, uh, but uh, you know, are starting to come back. Uh, in any case, we have a major disruption now uh, in terms of uh, re-engineering our services and orientation, and people are more accepting of change right now. Uh, so it's a good time to be proactive. And so for me, it's a question of what is the right portfolio of physical-based activities and services and digitally-based services activities? Uh, for, for the next few years. Uh, so we wanna leverage, this, leverage our strengths in libraries from our ever expanding digital collections. Uh, but we do have 117,000 physical locations, right? Which is quite a national infrastructure. And so how do we best use the collective resource to serve people in this country? And I've started to ponder that, but I think the people at, the, at this meeting today, I think are, are ideally placed to think about this and offer ideas to our colleagues in the library community more broadly in terms of how to think about these kinds of questions. And of course, the answers to these questions are important to me because I need to know that in terms of what do we advocate for from a public policy perspective, right? Where are we going? Uh, but it's a big challenge, opportunity, and imperative for library leaders and visionaries and strategists. So that's one issue. The other one is more related to the more recent developments in legislative matters, especially with digital books. So it's really concerns about how to leverage the momentum from the state developments of late. And a thank you to the Association of American Publishers for uh, helping to further raise the profile of our issue. Uh, but now that, it's, that, that the profile is being raised you know, considerably, how do we make the best use of that? Uh, so there are two important lessons from the state campaigns, I think worth noting. 
Uh, one is that the, about the little, very little understanding or appreciation of the dramatic change in rights going from print materials under copyright law to digital materials under contracting regimes. Now we are all, of course, intimately familiar with all this for many years, but most people are not. Uh, and so, so that's, I think, an important thing to keep in mind in terms of that's the situation uh, and that we need to change it. Uh, and the reason why we need to change it is that the other lesson from the state campaigns is that when this is explained, when they understand uh, the state legislators you know, and their colleagues are surprised or even incredulous uh, in terms of like, you know, how can this really be happening? Or even, are you sure you're right about this? This can't be true. Do we really need a law for this? You know, the idea that, of course, publishers sell all this stuff to libraries. Why, why wouldn't they do that? Or why couldn't you just buy it? And of course, that's not true. Uh, and so, you know, so it's like, so how do we cultivate and explain challenges to other legislatures, legislators uh, in other states? And, and also, of course, at the federal level. So part of it is developing materials to help with this process, uh, developing legislator champions and other people key in the community, uh, and especially people who are not in the library community, but like, you know, key community and state and national leaders beyond. Uh, but we have to understand that this process will take a number of years or even many years. So it's an incremental process and we kind of chip away at it, uh, but that's how we make progress usually in how legislative matters go. Uh, and of course, at some point we want to introduce, leg introduce legislation too. Uh, but it's much more than introducing a bill uh, because anyone who knows about Congress knows that, yeah, there's a lot of bills introduced, but most of them go nowhere, right? So you, you need a path forward beyond introduction. Uh, and then finally that uh, these issues, of course, go beyond digital books, that it's about all kinds of digital content and services, right? It's not just, not just digital books. Uh, and of course, it's not just a library issue too. Because these rights going from the you know from the print age to the digital age, from copyright to licensing, uh, that affects everybody, right? Libraries, but uh, museums, archives, uh, the general public, you know. So it's a much it's a, it's a huge issue in that sense. Uh, and so those are my two issues. Thanks, John. Thank you, Alan. Um, now, you know, before we queue up Felton, uh, batting cleanup is Jean-Claude Brizard, uh, an educator, uh, a civic leader, and for the last year or so, year or two years, the head of Digital Promise, uh, which I feel like just its name alone is such a help, nice, optimistic, forward-looking um, uh, framing. So Jean-Claude, thanks for being here. Over to you. John, thanks for, for having me. Actually, it's been 10 and a half months <laughs> uh, as a lead for Digital Promise, but this topic has been, been part of my core for the last 35 years in public education. Um, so thanks again for, for having me here. So a bit about who we are. We were created out of an act of Congress in 2008 uh, as the National Center on Digital Technologies and Research. Um, we are launched under Obama in 2011. Again, it's idea really of pushing uh, for the world to better understand uh, what technology means for for education, so we've been at this for a very long time before and before the before the pandemic, which is why I think anchoring us on the why I think is going to be critical. One, we think hybrid learning is here to stay and has been frankly for a while. Um, we think the ideas of powerful technology or really good access to technology can enable a much more dynamic set of curriculum pedagogy in our schools um, and frankly allows for the kinds of ubiquitous learning we know is so critical and important. Uh, I know many young people who learn all the time because they have access to libraries, have access to devices, et cetera. For many of our, our young people don't have access to these kinds of enabling technologies that often is, is limited. So my, my discussion quickly will over index a bit on the P12 system, although we do work along as an organization along the entire P to workforce continuum. And we can talk about frankly how important that is for adults as well too, which you guys have been talking about. But let's focus a bit on the on the P12 system uh, and think about frankly the future of, of digital uh, uh, technology. Last June, um, 2021, uh, New America published a really, I think, I think a seminal report uh, research piece called Learning at Home While Under 
connected. I'll put the link in the chat a few seconds, a few minutes here. Uh, we learned a lot in that study. One is that we've made great progress closing access to devices and broadband. We went from 64% of six to 13 year olds getting access to that kind of technology in 2015 to 84% having access in 2021. We also saw in the report that the positive impact on not just the young people, but the entire family was pronounced because these devices were used by adults you know, for jobs to do a bunch of things, um, in effect, even at times, I think, even accessing uh, digital libraries. The, the challenge that we saw in the report was that even though we're making good progress in getting uh, access to devices and broadband, um, much of the time, and about 55% of, of the respondents say that the internet, that the access to broadband was too slow or insufficient. There's the reports of young people in classrooms learning and the device would go dark because the, the, the data system wasn't um, fully um, enough. Um, we even found that even among families with computers and broadband, um, a major a majority of them really were under connected. Again, insufficient, unreliable access to the internet, and, for this, and of course, internet devices. Many folks were using the cell phones. And of course, we all know the data plans, many of these cell phones were not sufficient for the work they wanted to do. Uh, a colleague at, uh, at Microsoft often talks about this in three prongs, that we have an affordability issue, an availability issue, and an access issue. At Digital Primates, we've had this project program supported by, by Verizon called the Verizon Innovative Learning Schools Program. Right now, it's, uh, it's across uh, 34 plus states in about 600 schools, where we're demonstrating really how to solve for those three things, affordability, availability, and access. But there's a fourth dimension that this program really has been demonstrating, what coaching and support for school staff, principals, teachers, uh, how to integrate the, the work, the, the technology into the curriculum really is a fundamental uh, fourth lever, fourth pillar to this kind of access. Those four in those 600 schools really have demonstrated what is possible. And as you can imagine, we've been pushing those kinds of learning quite a bit to um, our colleagues on the Hill uh, and frankly, even more importantly, our colleagues at the state education departments. Um, one of our uh, partners and colleagues, uh, Michael Calabrese at New America, um, talks about this particular fact. Uh, last year, as part of the $1.9 trillion American Rescue Plan, uh, Congress adopted a $7 billion emergency connectivity fund to help schools and libraries pay for internet service and devices for remote learning during the pandemic. The problem is it's a temporary program. Um, you know, the permanent program that exists in schools is called E-Rate, as many of you uh, all know, but E-Rate does not allow for its funds to be used off school property. One of the pushes and, and questions that we're beginning to push now, both to the agencies and to the feds is that can we begin to revisit E-Rate to look at ways of addressing those kinds of obstacles. Um, again, um, as you can imagine, we're not the only ones pushing this. It is being done by many of our colleagues um, um, in foundations like the Gates Foundation and others like uh, ISTE, the, uh, an organization that really focuses on, on technology in schools, uh, to really find ways of influencing how the FCC and others really look at a kind of possibility that can support schools um, in, in the long run. So we really believe in the why that this is really about getting kids access to technology so they can get access to powerful learning. We also believe that this idea of really access to technology and broadband, if we can find a way of really making that part of the infrastructure uh, and really lean on examples like the Verizon Innovative Learning Schools Program, we really begin to close the gap that we see across the US. Back to you, John. I'm gonna let Felton take over. Yeah, I'm gonna jump in. And so I have questions for all four of you. And I'm gonna start with Dr. Pizarro because we just ended with you and you brought up a lot of questions that I think are really interesting for the larger group to, to kind of deal with. I, I think we see here in Cleveland, what you have just spoken about, the fact that access is being provided at a, at a level that has never been provided. I think everybody kind of got shook up by the last two years and not seeing kids not being able to have access. But now everyone is kind of stuck in this space of, well, now they have access, they don't have digital proficiency. 
So, and you know, I know this is something that your organization works on a great deal. Um, this idea of digital literacy and what can be done. How do you see libraries playing a role in this aspect of being able to help that when folks get access, being able to help people become more proficient in the use of this of these materials? No, it's it's. I think it's a it's a timely question, and and perhaps go back to a discussion we had. Uh, um, that I think um, DPLA organized uh, last summer that talked about this idea of libraries being an extension uh, of the school after school. At the same time, we know many schools have libraries within the day school, uh, inside the school. So you think about, frankly, the curriculum and pedagogy that exists, it is not a, 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 just a bridge, but it's frankly is part of the infrastructure as we think about learning. This idea of ubiquitous learning we think is in, in always really critical and important. So in our pedagogy, in our coaching of teachers, with our coaching of school staff, we talk about all that's available for them across the entire 24 hour, seven day a week cycle uh, for young people and their, and their families. That is exactly what we're trying to advocate for in the exemplars we try, we we're building. But to your point, getting that kind of information and knowledge base uh, to our practitioners, including our librarians, I think is a critical part of the work that frankly we have been doing and need to continue to do in much more of an earnest way. I think frankly, uh, much of the effort talks about schools, we often talk about the support systems that exist uh, that frequently are not just ancillary to, but are really a critical part of the school. One quick example, um, uh, when I used to work at the Gates Foundation, I used to visit schools in King County quite a bit. And what I found and saw, Renton Public Schools is the first school system to close in the country back in 2020. And I used to remember seeing a lot of young people and their families in libraries in Renton, and all that disappeared overnight. Um, and really, that kind of ecosystem understanding I think is the way in which we're approaching this kind of work. Thank you so much. Now, I, I wanted to, uh, we have a question in the Q&A for, uh, that I think is perfect for you, Alan. So I'm gonna send this your way. Um, Christopher's question was, was based on how do we kind of move forward considering what's happened in New York and Maryland here? Um, and, you know, I, I saw you, you kind of, kind of speak out on this and Twitter and, Alan's a great Twitter follow, just for any of those who may want to know. But <laughs> speak to speak to what happened in New York because it really it, it's it's really kind of set us back a little bit here. And you might want to give it some context for folks who may not know about uh, what happened there. Yeah, sure, Felton. So in in New York, uh, so there was a bill that uh, would provide. Uh, access to libraries uh, for uh, for digital books uh, under under reasonable terms, uh, and it cleared the legislature with only uh, one vote against it, uh, and so it was you know, overwhelming support, and so it went to the governor, who at the very last hour, uh, she has ten days to to do whatever, uh, she decided to to veto the bill, uh, so that's actually what happened, uh, and then she, and she gave a. Uh, the reason was basic, basically that it was a conflict with copyright law, and therefore she she vetoed the bill. Uh, so you, I'm sorry, you wanted me to go to what beyond that? No, that that was I, I mean. So where do we we stand when we have these seeming seeming victories, and they're just kind of clawed back mm -hmm. from us? You know, I, you, you kind of spoke to it from the standpoint of you know this is going to be a slow process. I think, you know, and I will kind of speak to Michelle on this where, I, you know, I think a lot of for us in the library world feel like we don't have time for a slow process because if, if folks don't get access to materials, we're really basically just kind of continuing this digital divide where those who can afford can get and those who can't are not going to be able to get, um, get access because if the libraries can't provide it, then uh, only the people who can really pay for it can. Right. Uh, well, I think there's several levels to pursue there. Uh, so one, in terms of the legislative arena, uh, I mean, unfortunately, it is uh, typically a fairly slow process. And, and so in, by contrast, in Maryland, that, uh, that law, that the legislation did, in fact, become law. But as I, I suspect many of you know, the Association of American Publishers filed a complaint in federal court uh, to you know, to uh, as a, a to seek a, an injunction against that that particular law, 
Uh, and that is all now pending in, in district court. Uh, and there's a hearing scheduled in about four weeks of, about that matter. Uh, and so, but you can imagine whatever happens there was likely to be appealed and so on. So that that's not gonna be a very fast process in, in any event. Uh, and so, but, but there are, there's other tracks though, I think that uh, in terms of like addressing the digital divide that we need to do, that we still need to negotiate to the extent that we can with publishers. Uh, we need to seek other funding uh, and so that, so that we can bolster our digital acquisitions and provide access. Uh, and we, there are different things that we can be doing at the same time. Uh, but the reason why we still wanna, even if we can do some of the shorter term things, that why we wanna do the, the legislative route is that uh, we need a permanent answer to this. Right, because we had copyright law, which was a permanent answer for you know for decades or even more than a century, and now we don't have that kind of access or those rights anymore in the digital environment. And so we need a reinstatement of some of our rights that we've lost, frankly. Uh, and so we need to pursue that. Uh, and so, so even if that takes a long time in the context of trying to solve today's problems, uh, you know, when you have that long in the longer run though, it's not a long time. And even if it takes 10 years to fix it, well, we need to fix because the digital age is gonna be around for many decades to come. Thanks, Alan. I think that leads into uh, Michelle in a conversation because when you were speaking, you were speaking to just this point that, right, for those who, if, if we can't figure out how to provide more access, right, especially in libraries, and you know, really kind of this is the whole purpose of the Palace Project, right? Everyone suffers and this divide just continues. So, you know, kind of speak to, to this, this space on, you know, you know, how the Palace Project is moving with this, with this in mind. Yeah, sure. I mean, the Palace Project has really taken what I call a pragmatic <laughs> approach because we are trying to change the model, uh, but do it in a way that's pragmatic. So we're not out, we're not advocates of the law. We, you know, we don't have, we're not a 504 or what it, the advocacy definition. So we're trying to do it through working directly with publishers as I think most people on the call here know. Um, you know, we've been working with Amazon and Audible. Um, you know, when I was at DPLA, you know, we actually brokered the deal with um, Amazon and we started at a place of not, um, we started at a place of collaboration, not at a place of, okay, you know, if you can't provide this, then we're not going to talk to you. So really they absolutely didn't want to do um, one lender perpetual use, one, one copy, one lend. And the reason for that was, at least of what they communicated, was that they didn't have a revenue share model that would go back to their authors that made sense uh, to allow that model to happen. But they did say, hey, these other four models, we would be happy to test and try those models to see if they would work for libraries. And one of those models, which is the 40 lens, 10 at a time, which is more like a pay-per-use model. Um, we actually came up with based on data provided to us by one of the Washington State consortia. So, and then there were three other models in addition to that. So we're just trying to really move the conversation forward <laughs> with publishers that are willing to explore different models and hopefully expose those models to libraries and change the paradigm of um, there's only one model that works and there's nothing else. So let's let's broaden the models, let's get some data, let's see if we can reach a different steady state than, than what has been the case in the past few years. So that's been our approach. Thanks. Now, Greg, um, it's been a while since we have the chance to, to talk with you here. And so thank you for being so patient. I wanted to, to talk to you. You brought up the idea of money. And this is a question that I'm going to start with you, but I want um, the others to chime in about uh, with this idea of there is a lot of money out there now for digital access, right? There's a lot of money being put forward 
Um, I think it was $65 billion that's in um, uh, President Biden's uh, Build Back Better for infrastructure. There's money in the ARPA money. And yet, right, we know that in library land that you're talking about, you know, $9 million that might be in the budget and you've got 1,130 libraries. And um, there just doesn't seem to be a lot of that money being folded down into the public libraries and or in libraries in general through the state. Um, what are you seeing as far as accessibility? Are, are, are folks looking out for the public, or not public libraries, I, I have a public library lens, but libraries in general, are you seeing um, being able to work with the state and seeing them have a, a, a lens by which they see the importance of libraries? Well, this, this administration in California has made the largest single investment in it's in California's public libraries in the state's history. And so last year, they, we went from $50 million in local assistance to over a half a billion dollars. And the majority of the half a billion is to upgrade, uh, you know, aging library facilities. And uh, there's a local match requirement and the, the funding's important, it's necessary, it's long overdue. But it's, you know, putting in a new HVAC system and a new roof doesn't necessarily create a 21st century library. And so it's, I, I think a, a lot of the opportunity lives in c connecting the value of investing in libraries with a lot of other initiatives, not just in California's budget, but in other budgets elsewhere, right? So what builds community resilience? Libraries, right? So if we're passing an infrastructure bill that as we have in the, on the federal level, right? That purports not just to talk about, right? Physical facilities, but social infrastructure. Well, okay. So why the hell ain't there money in there for libraries, right? To strengthen the social cohesion and the resilience of communities. And I think it's just, a, it's a question of, um, you know, creating the relationships and getting people to think about libraries. I mean, how many, how many times have you said something about libraries to somebody and immediately they say, oh, libraries, and they've got like some, you know, life-changing library story that they tell you. Okay, but I defy you to find people right outside of maybe the group of people on this call who come up and start talking about libraries. Like you have to remind people how awesome they are and the value of it. And on, on our state library website, we, we spent a fair amount of dough um, creating uh, basically a place that talks about the actual return on investment of putting money into libraries, right? I mean, so it's not, it's not just about community resilience, right? And, and it's, you know, good of the order kind of stuff. It's a smart taxpayer investment, right? Because you put in a buck to libraries, you're going to get $5 back sometimes like actually literally, and other times kind of quantitatively. And I, I would just pivot away from that uh, uh, to echo what Michelle was saying. So when it came time for California to begin investing in a statewide digital library to help our libraries, everything that she just said about um, Palace's approach is, is why we chose to partner with Palace because of the way that they're approaching all these kind of, you know, what previously have been really vexing and um, in some cases sort of, I mean, insurmountable impediments to, to doing this kind of work. And I, I really, really like um, th this kind of effort of collaboration. And, and again, right, it's the same sort of thing, finding relationships, okay, Here's what works for us, what works for you. Can we find something that works for both of us now, please? So. Thank you, Greg. Did anyone want to jump in on the funding question before we move on to some others? There's one. I would also say that for the 65 billion or whatever it is that's made available, the Fed sure don't make it easy to apply for it. And they routinely, I, I mean, not to somebody stop me before I embarrass myself here, but they routinely conflate like schools and libraries. So like 
hey, why don't you provide all of this information about usage, right, for the past 10 years, and maybe we'll give you one year worth of E-rate or connectivity discounts. And it's like, that's a non-starter for libraries, right? Schools yeah. can do it because they're responsible for these kids because they're minors. But it's just, it's just kind of nutty. And, and you raise it and they say, oh, gosh, yeah, you know, uh, that, that is kind of weird. We'll get back to you. So, Philip, can you just add to what Greg was just pushing? And, and, and I, I agree with just about everything um, he, he, was, he was saying here. Um, one is that, I mean, this idea that, uh, well, first of all, we have data to show that libraries have been disappearing from schools for the last, I don't know, decade or so, right? Yeah. So a lot of school libraries just disappeared. Um, so for more and more parents, the, the community libraries where they actually are leaning, um, leaning on, uh, my neighbor is a librarian. So uh, in Menlo Park, California, I, I know we talk quite a bit about the connection between what he does and quickly what schools are doing in the community. So I, I love the idea of looking at, again, I keep talking about this ecosystem play here, right? So how do we lean on each other to so folks understand this expensive definition of learning in places for kids to learn that more and more we, we're seeing because the schools are closing intermittently that disruption may become the norm for the, for the foreseeable future how do you leverage the community that community's asset frankly to keep kids engaged in learning um and frankly libraries can serve a ton for that so i think it's a matter of really locking arms going to the policy uh, makers making sure our, our practitioners to our systems leaders understand what this is in my former work again at gates the lot of work in washington state um looking at seattle and, and the like we always looked at the housing authority the libraries the, the schools how are they working together to solve a fundamental problem of continuous learning that kind of view i think needs to be part of how we actually approach our, our advocacy work that's true. Let's Great. talk. Yeah, that's true. Let's, let me bring Alan in on this because Alan, one of the uh, questions in the, the chat, uh, in the question and answer was, um, is there a legislation to make the emergency connectivity fund uh, permanent? Oh, okay. Well, if I can respond to the other question briefly. Yes, uh, please do. So there is something specifically called the Digital Equity Act. Uh, which is 2.75 billion within the infrastructure bill that, that recently passed. And so that is going to the going to the Department of Commerce now, uh, and they are working on developing those grant guidelines. Uh, and so it's one of our major issues nowadays to try to you know, get libraries in there as much as possible uh, because it's, it's money that, well, as, it, as the act names implies, digital equity, so it's not only for hardware, so like the, like the ECF, for example, is about, you know, is about internet access and devices, which is really important, but it doesn't, it doesn't impl implicate content of any kind or services or training or, or whatever. But this particular pot of money will implicate that. Uh, and so we want to get, we from a Washington point of view, want to get libraries, you know, part of those grant regulations uh, and then, of course, we need libraries to, you know, actively uh, apply for those funds too. Uh, now, as far as the ECF becoming permanent, uh, so there was a little bit of money in the Build Back Better Act, which is, of course, now uh, the future of that is unknown. Uh, and so we'll, we'll see. Uh, uh, Senator Markey and some other folks did introduce a bill to extend it for five years. Uh, and, but that hasn't really gone anywhere quite yet, uh, mostly because we're waiting for the Build Back Better Act to, to be resolved before you know, anything else is considered. So yeah, there is, a, uh, there is some, some interest, and I would say that he is you know, especially uh, one of the big uh, leaders on, on that uh, in terms of making it permanent or at least extending it beyond the current, the current time. Uh, but even currently, though, so it was it was uh, appro appropriate at seven billion dollars, uh, and there's still over a billion dollars left to be to be allocated. So that there is going to be a third funding round at some point. So that I'm not sure when that's going to happen, uh, but you know, look for sometime in the next you know several months, I suppose. Oops, you're on mute, Felton. Yeah, I'm got it. Thank you. Uh, um, thanks, Alan. And I just wanted to offer Michelle that opportunity to speak on the financing because the Palace Project is is trying to find financing to move things forward, and we have found support from a 
of various foundations, but this to, to move something, a project like this along, you're gonna to have to find additional funds. Yeah, so we received a fairly large grant fund from the Knight Foundation. I think as quite a few people have heard, it's $5 million investment from Knight. That was built on a foundation of a large investment from Sloan prior to that, where a lot of this work started at the Digital Public Library of America. The project is now headquartered at Lyricist, where um, the, most of the team is also headquartered. Uh, but in addition to money from those grant organizations, Lyricist has also kicked in quite a bit of money um, in terms of putting staff full time on the project. And lastly, uh, this project does not only exist solely by grant funding. We have a recurring revenue stream model, which um, we host the platform for libraries and there's a charge associated with that. We also run the Palace Marketplace and some of the, the monies from the marketplace come to, to fund the and sustain the project in whole. So we have you know, a, a plan, I'm gonna call it like a business plan to, to keep the platform and the marketplace running in perpetuity um, based on revenue coming in from those streams. So uh, thanks, Michelle. I, I wanna make sure as we get to the end of our hour here that we answer the questions that were in the question and answer. And one of them speaks to um, what can be done to make sure that um, everyone has the skill training path that is necessary for them to find stable housing, uh, have equitable wages, find the jobs that are available to a workforce um, that is going to be built around being digitally proficient. And if anyone wanted to quickly take that question on. I'm calling John Claude. Happy to, to, to jump on that. When, when you look at our work at Digital Promise, we, we uh, focus on the entire P to workforce continuum. We have three goals, talks about awful learning in K-12 or P-16, early learning, STEM work, post-secondary uh, access, including what we do on credentialing with the US Chamber and, and companies like Walmart around digital wallets, et cetera. Uh, but we think undergirding all of that is access to technology, access to digital technology. Without that, frankly, everything is moot. So we talk about that as a foundation powerful technology for powerful, powerful learning, which is why we play both at this idea of really helping practitioners understand this whole concept of digital literacy, both in terms of supporting learning in the classroom and frankly adults around access to that. But we also work to demonstrate what's possible with the funding. In fact, we have a discussion tomorrow uh, with a panel of superintendents, New America, to talk about very simply about this idea of, of uh, closing the digital divide once and for all how to actually do that, which is why I mentioned this idea of E-rate going beyond the walls of the school is one way of looking at this. The other thing is how we take a look at talking to state agencies, state governors, the FCC, what could be of the infrastructure that could be provide a kind of support for all people, even the, the broadband companies like Verizon is thinking deeply about that. How do you look at municipalities uh, as a way of providing access to board? This is what they do on broadband. The device again is another challenge, but I think there is funding that can be had if, if, if again, as Alan sort of outlined, if channeled appropriately uh, to support, especially those folks who know are um, furthest from opportunity. I, I think John Claude, it also goes back to what you were talking about earlier uh, with libraries and schools working together and integrating. You know, we're all we're all part of the solution here. What's the part where we can play the most significant role? So one thing we're learning through this platform of, of job skill and job training is that it's opened up conversations between libraries and local workforce development agencies and job centers yes. who may not have the dough to connect to those kind of resources. And so the partnership of the library plus the job center, right, with the kind of one-on-one -on -one thing that's happening there, um, and teaching people to use these resources for themselves. I mean, that's been really, uh, I think that's, you know, it's kind of getting all of us to talk to each other and figure out, you know, what, if somebody's intersecting with what, you know, what they used to call somewhere in the social safety net, right? It, wherever they intersect, they're getting the same package of 
of assistance, right? Mm -hmm. So if you're if you're going to the WIC office and signing, I'm making this up, but if you go to the WIC office to sign up for that program, right? Well, there's also something that turns you on to the good things that you can get at the library or you know, childcare opportunities in the neighborhood, right? So that it's it's kind of a package that's put together by all of the different participating parties. Now, yes, is that easy? Not so much. No, but just just thirty seconds. I'm sorry, Delvin, uh, uh, to what you just said, which I think is critical. A few examples: uh, the Commit Partnership in Dallas has this kind of backbone orientation to bringing folks together. Um, the Cleveland Foundation, we know, working with Eric Gordon and others, brings the United Way and a bunch of folks around this kind of work. Uh, we've seen this work in Tacoma with Graduate Tacoma. So you have these sort of backbone organization who can be the connective tissue for different agencies within a particular community to bend together to solve these kinds of problems collectively. But you're right, that's the way to approach this work. All righty, well, I was trying to be too smart and trying to take the question that Jen Johnson asked and not ask it in the way she specifically wrote it. So I will, she has re-asked the question and it's, she says, as stated, I'm asking what libraries can do to improve access to basic human needs like housing and healthcare, as we are learning that tech and digital access are not the full solutions we thought they would be. Well, just briefly, I, I mean, I, I think libraries, one of the strengths of libraries and one of the things that makes them an essential service is their ability to help you connect to what it is that you need, right? The, whether it's information, whether it's services, whatever it happens to be to on-ramp you, if you will, right to the, to, to the road that gets you to where you wanna go. And so a, a lot of these things are happening now um, in, in libraries kind of organically, right? So many libraries I visited around the state have sort of checklists of your agencies that do A, B, C, and D. So that if somebody is coming to the library, um, uh, right, they can refer them to somewhere and the personal connection between that library and the person who is the contact there often helps facilitate, right, the delivery of service, whatever that happens to be to the person. Now, that being said, I mean, I've seen it at work more strongly in the physical library space, right? Somebody walks in and comes to the counter and has a question. And I'm not certain that uh, digitally libraries do that as well as we could or should. Well, I think, and I will, because we're running out of time here and, and take the time to try to answer some of these because all of our questions just seem to come in at the last minute here. But one of the questions um, it, the, as she's asking it, Jen is asking, is the fact that I think libraries have stepped up in those spaces in so many different ways. I know in our library just over this weekend, we handed out our 20,000 um, COVID kit to our community members and so many others across the country. Just in the state of Ohio, we provided over a half million COVID kits to our libraries, uh, COVID testing kits. So I, I think when there is a need, the libraries end up being that place. And I think though, to Jen's question is, I think there, there may be a way for us to start evaluate more of how we not be the last we, we evaluate as organizations, how we are much more uh, kind of uh, prepared for how we are going to move forward with, uh, with a plan as compared to kind of just dealing with the aftermaths of, of different um, really difficult, challenging situations. Um, Lana, absolutely, you can check in your local library. Uh, her question was any, can you, uh, people access records for, who are living out of state at other local libraries? That's an absolute, certainly in the state of Ohio, that's true. And then uh, there's some E-rate questions that Chris has asked and some questions that we will answer online. I wanna take this time because um, we are over our time to really thank our speakers today. Dr. Rizar, thank you so much. Dr. Inoue, thank you so much. Michelle, thank you very much. And Greg, of course, thank, thank you. you back there in the great state of California for locking it down for our folks there. So with that, 
I am going to turn it back over to John. And we are very thankful for you at DPLA for our speakers today. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to turn it back over to Denise to adjourn us. But before I do, I want to just, you know, underline the thanks that Felton just shared. Everything we do here is a partnership and a collaboration. And with that in mind, I want to underline two of the links that that Kat's throwing into the chat. Um, two events we have coming up later this month. One is on the theme of collaborating for access. We're holding this event with COSLA, the state, so the state, the National Association of State Librarians, and with Readers First, our friend Michael Blackwell and the folks at Readers First, and that is going to be a discussion with libraries and our board member Calvin Watson will be joining us and publishers. So Kat's put the link in for the info for that. Later this month, we're doing we're launching a new collection. Um, and with it's a collaboration with CLEAR, the University of Miami, Duke and History Miami, and it's a Pan Am digital collection that actually Michelle, back in her DPLA days, was was core in getting that off the ground. So Michelle, you get a special invite to come back and be part of that launch later this month. Um, thank you all so much. Denise, I'll hand it over to you. That's the end of, of my business. I really appreciate all of you taking time to spend time with us today at DPLA. Absolutely. Thanks again to all of our panelists. Uh, this was a very interesting conversation and um, this kind of discussion that I think uh, we will be repeating often and hopefully in very healthy ways in the near future because this is real life playing out for all of us. I uh, want to thank our uh, DPALA colleagues today for helping to put the program together. And uh, that being said, uh, as chair, it's my job to adjourn this here meeting and wish everybody a great 2022. As John said, I think, I think a lot of good things are going to happen this year. Hopefully not all of them to us, but hopefully all of them with us. Uh, stay healthy out there. Thank you. All right. Bye-bye.